Well, again, good morning, church. It's good to see you again. You glad to be here? I mean, we're fired up right now. I mean, we're worship, good. Well, I, I want to do something that's a little bizarre. First, before we begin, I just want to say thank you on behalf of Pastor Dan and myself for all the ways in which you have said we are appreciative of our pastors. We thank you for uh, letting us be your pastors and for all the ways and all the notes and all the gifts that you've given us this last couple of weeks, we say thank you. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We really have felt your love and appreciation. And uh, I felt like Sally Fields. You like me. You really like me. You know, um, that's going to go over a lot of heads, but it's all right. Um, uh, so again, thank you. Uh, I want to invite you to do one other thing today. Um, I know we're not a stand up, sit down kind of church, but I want to invite you to stand up again. I know you just sat down, but I want to invite you to stand up as you're able, uh, because what we want to do this morning, um, we're going to join the tradition of the church across the globe. We're going to stand for the reading of God's word today. All right. And um, we're going to, I mean, all of it's good, right? It's hard to find some not so good. I mean, there's some weird stories in here, but all of it's good. But today... It's good. We're going to read from one of the Psalms, um, the prayer book of Jesus, the prayer book of the ancient Hebrews, but we're going to read Psalm 100 this morning, okay? Oh, it's a good one. You ready? I love doing this one, and, and I love doing it out loud. It's one thing to just read it. It's another thing to read it out loud, all right? So Psalm 100 says this, shout with joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Oh, you're going to do it with me. Good. Come before him, singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever. And his faithfulness continues to each generation. This is God's word for God's people. If you believe it, let me hear you say, I hear it and I believe it. That was pathetic. (laughs) We just read this. It is a song of thanksgiving. This is God's word for God's people. If you believe it, let me hear you say, I hear it and I believe it. it. Now you're ready. You can sit down. I love Psalm 100. Oh, what a joyful song, right? I don't know about you, but when I read Psalm 100 out loud, it's kind of like, um, it's like a shot of joy, just that just gets infused in me. It's like a Red Bull for my soul. Double espresso for for my whole being. It just gets me going, right? Wouldn't it be something, though, to take that, that energy, that joy, that, that Red Bull for the soul, and hold on to it for more than just a few moments? Wouldn't it be great? to stay right here in the midst of this sweet spot of deep joy and just let it do its work? Wouldn't that be great? Good news is this, we can. (laughs) So many of us this morning, we have uh, gathered in this space and uh, whether we want to acknowledge it or not, now some of us, have, you know, got, we are acknowledge, we're acknowledging it differently, but many of us right now are very worried about the coming week. Um, we're, we're, it's understandable. There's an understandable fretting, I think, that's going on that we're absorbed into because of the election, right? The election is about big things. And I, I don't know if this is true for you, but for me, it seems that depending on your pick, we're either at salvation of the Republic or the threshold of Armageddon, right? There's no in between, um, it, 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 if, I, if I choose this person, um, then, and he, he or she wins, woohoo! If not, oh, oh my God, what's going to happen? We're all going to die! <laughs> Am I wrong? It's everywhere, right? I, I don't know about you, but I think most of us, we just want to escape the crazy. We want to get away from the madness. 
I know I, I've, I've said my piece on the elections the last several weeks. Uh, if you missed that, I encourage you to go back and, and watch those two sermons. Um, uh, and, and, uh, but what I, I want to share with you this morning, I think, I, in fact, no, I believe, is uh, as we explore this thing this next several weeks now in, in this month, there's a heritage, there's an identity marker that I think will help us endure the second wave of hurricane political opinions. I really do. I think there's something here that's so massively important for us that it can buoy us in the midst of the storm. I listened to a sermon this this last week by a ministry colleague of mine, a friend of mine by the name of Dale Locke. He's a pastor on the other side of Florida. And he referenced a book. I'm going to tell you the author. I'm going to tell you the book. I'm going to tell you the author. I'm also going to say, don't go buy it. All right? The book is The Triumph of Christianity, How a Forbidden Religion Swept the World. I love that title. Let me give it to you again. The triumph of Christianity, how a forbidden religion swept the world. That's cool stuff. It's by, get this, an agnostic New Testament scholar. He's a New Testament scholar who is an unbeliever. I don't get that, quite frankly. I don't know how that works. But this scholar, his name is Dr. Bart Ehrman, he wrote this book, and as a historian, he has to acknowledge that something happened in the first three centuries of this thing called the church that was unprecedented in world history. It didn't happen any other place, any other time, that those first three centuries, something unprecedented occurred through this new gospel message that was spread. From where? Started in the hills of Galilee. We would call that the sticks today, the, the backwaters. And eventually, this backwaters message from the stick it took over an entire empire who originally, remember, it was a governor of that empire who was responsible for killing the leader of this movement. Do you remember him? Guy by the name of Pilate. Pilate, a spokesperson for Rome, kills Jesus. And a mere 300 years later, the emperor of Rome is going, no, I like this. We should do this. We should do this. Something unprecedented was going on here. And very, you know, I, when, I was, uh, when I was in college, I never, I, okay, I'm called the pastoral ministry, but I never thought I would do this. I'm glad. But I never thought I would do this. What I wanted to do in, co in college, man, I wanted to be one of these scholars who took on a group of people called the Jesus Seminar. Has anybody heard of the Jesus Seminar? I'm the only nerd in the room. Woohoo! All right, good. New stuff. The Jesus Seminar came out in the 90s. There were a bunch of scholars who got together to determine who the historical Jesus was versus the Jesus of faith. See, the, the Jesus Seminar do not believe that they're the same person. And the historical Jesus, the quest for the historical Jesus, they, these guys got together and they said, well, we don't think Jesus said that. We think Jesus said that, but he didn't say it that way. And so what they did is they divvied up all of the scripture with different colors and different little beads to determine. I think Dr. Ehrman was a part of that. I may be wrong, but he's a part of that whole line of thinking. And the, the Jesus seminar's job was to debunk Christianity, that we're just a bunch of nuts following a Jesus, a mythological Jesus, not a Jesus of history. I really hated that. I thought that's what I was going to do, to devote my life and ministry to showing what kind of false scholarly work these guys were doing. I still would love to do it. I just get to do this instead. What's amazing to me is even those who are on this historical Jesus faith, very few even there will deny that Jesus existed. Very few can deny that his message translated down through the church has radically influenced the civilization of all humanity. All of humanity, all of the world has been influenced in one way or another by the person of Jesus. Can't get away from it. And the question that Dr. Ehrman asked is, and I think it's fascinating, is why? What occurred? 
What was so different about the early church that led to 2,000 years of ongoing life and growth and massive change? Music, hospitals, science, art, all of it. Through whom? Through the church. My, my friend, my pastor, my, my pastor friend, Dale Locke, he shared in talking about this book, he shared five practices of the early church that are absolutely worth exploring. I promise you we're going to come back, but I want to share these five things, all right? These are five traits that he believes, and I tend to agree with them, five traits that he sees in the early church that were totally contrary to the world around them. Let's go over them real quick. First, they, the church was multiracial and multicultural. The church is the first movement in all history that says tribes and destinations and home groups. It doesn't matter anymore because the family of God is so much bigger and everybody's welcome in. The original church was made up of poor and rich, haves and have-nots, males and females, all of it. Rulers and beggars. All cultures came together in the church. It was that first thing that when the world looked at the church and they said, wait a minute, you're supposed to be over there with your tribe and you're supposed to be over there with your tribe. What are you doing together? We went, it's because of Jesus. The first thing that they saw about the church was that it was multi, multiracial, multicultural. It's a big difference. We like to think of ourselves as very homogenized and very vanilla and very everybody in your own thing. In fact, we still say that the most segregated hour in all of, the, all of this country is at the 11 o'clock worship service where we all meet in our different little spotting. That's not the early church. Expected something there. Okay. Number two. Number two, thing that separated them was a holistic ethic of life from womb to tomb. All right, now, in, in, in the, the, the early New Testament, first century, they still had something called abortion. All right, it is brutal. But more than abortion, what they had is they had something called leaving, where if a new infant was born, particularly if it was a girl, do you know what would be said? The father figure would say, we don't want a girl, go put it on the trash heap. And they would abandon babies in trash heaps. They would leave them on the side of the road to just die of natural causes. This was a normal thing in the Roman world. And the church said, nay, nay, we're not doing that. That's a precious child of God. That life means something. And so you have all these Christians who are walking around and they'd go, they were stationed at the dumps and they would find the babies and they would pick them up and they would take them home and they would care for them and they would love on them. The first orphanages in all the world started because of this ethic right here, this trait, from womb to tomb. This is also the church was the first organization that took care of its seniors. If you were a widower or a widow and you had no children, you had nobody around, you know who cared for you? The church. The church gathered around and said, no, you still have purpose. If you're still here, God still has something for you to do. This holistic ethic of life, womb to tomb, was something that significantly was a difference with the church and the culture in which it. Number three, hospitality and care for the poor. Do you know who mattered in the ancient world? The people who had stuff. Do you know who didn't? The poor. And the church said, no, 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 no. We're all family. We're all invited. We're all welcome. And so the poor were invited to come to the table and to eat and to fellowship. The poor, there were poor people who stepped into leadership in the church. They weren't ostracized to the corner. There's a, a, a radical care for the poor. When, when the first couple centuries were going on and there would be a, um, a plague, there would be some kind of big event that was happening and people are running. Do you know who is running in? The church. Often to its own detriment. I'm going to go in and take care of the sick and the wounded and the ill. I may get sick, wounded, and ill, but I'm going to do it because this is what I do trade of the church. Number four, radically sexually countercultural. You catch that? Radically sexually countercultural. What do I mean by that? Well, in the ancient world, if you were a married man and woman, the woman married, you are expected to stay true and stay pure to your husband. That's it. No ifs, ands, or buts. However, if you were a man, you could go sleep with anybody you want. You could go to the prostitutes. You could go to the temple prostitutes. You could exchange. You could do whatever you wanted because you are in charge. And the early church says, that's not right. There is a, you, there is, 
equity here. There's equality between male and female. If you're covenant in a sexual relationship, you stay committed to that sexual relationship. They also would say that that counterculture sexuality, really strongly the church would say, we believe that it is one man and one woman who've called together for this life of intimacy. That's how, that's how sexuality is expressed. Outside of that, outside of that married covenant and relationship, it don't happen. That's what the church is saying. You don't have to have sex in order to be happy. That's very counterculture to ours, isn't it? Oh, it's quiet. Number, pa pastor doesn't talk about sex. It gets quiet in the church, you know. Number five, it's passionately nonviolent. Do you know why it was nonviolent? Because most of their friends were hung on crosses. Or most of their friends were taken out into the Colosseum and ripped apart by lions, tigers, and bears. Oh, my. They were passionately nonviolent. War, military, church didn't do that. Now, I have to tell you, I am captivated by this list. I can't get it out of my head. And I will likely do a whole series on each of them very soon. I can promise you that. See, because it doesn't take a lot of creativity to see that our political parties in this country, we champion several of these markers, don't we? Of course, neither party platforms the whole list, neither one of them. Uh, in fact, two of the five are more common policies of the right, numbers two and four, when one and three are usually more common focuses of the left. What's fascinating to me is nobody wants to touch the fifth. Regardless of the rhetoric, both parties in our country are, have a high stake in violence and war. Woo! Neither political party gets all five of these traits and say, oh yeah, we can claim those. Mm -mm. Why? Because that would be a whole different thing. But I promise you, I'm not sneaking in election or political stuff this morning. I've already done that. Uh, what I'm saying is, it's clear to me and to many others that, that, that the early Jesus people, they had an identity, identity that was wildly different from the first century, from standard politics then and now. The early church wasn't left or right, it was totally other. They followed a completely different king. They lived from a completely different perspective, an entirely different kingdom life. And despite what scholars like Dr. Ehrman would say and what they would teach to us, Jesus did claim to be a king. Do you remember he was before Pilate? Pilate says, so are you a king or not? And what does Jesus say? My kingdom is not of this world. That's about as clear as you get that I have a kingdom somewhere. It's just not right here. And, and he did claim to be Lord of all. He did invite a radical relifing, an entirely upside down way of living that comes when we decide to follow him. You don't just get to say, I have decided to follow Jesus. I come and I have my little moment and then it's all done. No, that doesn't work. Because following Jesus then involves your all from that point on. We are a different breed of people, a different race, the early church even said. We live an entirely other way of life. And there is nothing in the life of the follower of Jesus that his way doesn't affect. There was a time in the church where people would come forward in the crusades. Uh, Dale says this, he says, they'd come for to get baptized. They would hold their swords outside of the water. So you can have all of me, Jesus, but not that. I still got to go do stuff with that. How many of us do the same thing? Oh, Jesus, you can have all of me, but not my politics. Oh, Jesus, you can have all of me, but not my sexuality. Oh, Jesus, you can have all about all of me except my Enneagram number or my Myers-Briggs number. You can have all of me except my introvertedness. You can have all of me except my anger and rage and wrath. You can have all of me except my drink or my smoke or my whatever. You can have all of me except my craving for food that I know I shouldn't eat. Ooh, it's quiet. 
There's nothing in the life of the follower of Jesus that his way doesn't affect. And today, this, the, I, I'm interested not just in those five elements. I promise you we're going to come back to those five. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but sometime soon. We're going to explore those five. But I think today, what I want to do today and into the course of the next several weeks is I want to look at what's underneath those external traits. What are those things that allow those five things that we know about so quickly? Well, I, I've already mentioned the first one, and that's that the early church was convinced they were part of a Jesus on earth as it is in heaven kind of kingdom. I know one church that they, they regularly say, Lord, Lord Jesus, come here in Charlotte County as you are in heaven. They get really specific. Come here at Edgewater as you are in heaven. Jesus, come. Whew, what if we prayed that? Come on my block. Come next to my neighbor who irritates the fire out of me. Come on 41 when those drivers are going, whatever, you know. You see, the early church, they were aware of government, governments and emperors. They were very aware of those emperors who were tying them up and killing them. Very aware. Very aware that they are being told not to do this, that, or the other. But they flatly claimed that these structures weren't in charge. They boldly say, oh, you're the emperor. That's nice. Jesus is king. Jesus is in charge. And they lived from that reality, not just on Sunday mornings in nice cushy chairs. They lived that all the time. Jesus is in charge. This starting point was claimed in the early church and the Jesus people and the kingdom people. And they said, we are to live like him. And they believed this is crazy that they could do it. I hear people all the time, oh, well, you know, I'll be like Jesus when I get to heaven and I cross over the river and I get there and I do my thing. No, the early church believed that we would follow Jesus and we would start being like him here and now. All of who is in Jesus lives inside of us. Why wouldn't we? Jesus gets to use my personality to do it all over again. He gets to use your personality to do it all over again. You know, the blessing is, is you don't have to be like me. And I don't have to be like you. Holy Spirit can use you to be just like you, but Jesus-like. Oh man, that's cool. The beloved disciple John said, said that, the, that the first kingdom trait of these Jesus people of living like him was one of love. It's sad to me today that when I say love, I get pulled into like uh, cultural hallmarky ideas and pictures that John would have just went, no. You know what I'm talking about, right? I mean, it, we're in November, so the Hallmark Channel has gone crazy already, right? Like, like for some of you, I just stepped on like sacred, as much sacred territory as ever, right? Right there. But I think John, love for John had no hallmark romanticism. In fact, love for John for the early church was this willful act of seeing and being. It was agape love, the very best kind of love. It was holistic and it was holy and it was transformative, it was fiery, it was intense, it was enduringly consistent. Remember what, what Paul says, love never gives up. You know what love did? It accepted people right where they were and it demanded a total rejection of any lesser attachment, physical attractions, or hallmark cheese. A holy love doesn't say, you do you. If it feels good, do it. That's not a holy love. Holy love says, Jesus has called me to sacrifice all of that to him. Yes. You know what that is? That's, a lo that's when love truly wins. I love these bumper sticker, love wins. I love that. That's great. What kind of love? Anything goes, that's not love. Sorry. It's not. Jesus' love is never you do you, but you be like him. Love starts it all. Oh, big deal, duh. We know that, Jim. We've been to church once or twice. Good job. Well done, preacher. 
See, the, but from love, in the Jesus way, the love of God, the love of others leads people to the next trait. You ready for it? It's going to blow your minds. You ready? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The next trait, thankfulness. <gasps> Well, how cute, Pastor Jim. It's the month of November. Of course, you're going to preach on thankfulness, right? How quaint. That's so special. Halloween is past. It's November. Of course, that's what we're going to do. I'm surprised you don't have a cornucopia up here at the front. <laughs> For Jesus' followers, Thanksgiving is not just a month and a meal. It's not a time to say, you know, we really should be more thankful after the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Now pass the taters. Right? It's not a time to say we should, we should. Thanksgiving is, is a genetic marker for the Christian who is living in the kingdom. It's a genetic marker. And, 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 and I say Thanksgiving is this, it's, that's not 100% accurate. Thanksgiving is the trait of the genetic marker. It's the action. Thanksgiving, did you know, is a retro act. It's something we do after the fact. It's the something else has occurred for in order for me to be thankful, right? The something else is one of those fundamental traits of the people of the way. That word, that something else is the word gratitude. If you're like me, you might think that those are synonyms. Gratitude is a state of being. It's a mindset. It's a way of your heart. It's an active lifestyle, not just a response. Gratitude is a choice of our identity, of our being. Thankfulness expresses that way of gratitude, that being. Are you flowing with me? Are you tracking? Thankfulness happens as a response to what has occurred. Thankfulness, again, a response. Gratitude is a way of being. The two are often seen very, but there's a difference. There's a difference between being active and being reactive. You know what I'm saying? I can be reactive on a lot of things. It's totally different for me to be active on the front end. Our word gratitude, it comes from the Latin word gratia, which means grace or graciousness. Oh, that's good, right? We're going to stick with that one, all right? Grace, this free, undeserved gift of favor. There, that grace and gratitude are linked. It's like, the same, it's like the same coin, two different sides. They go hand in hand. Karl Barth, German theologian, he says this, grace evokes gratitude like the voice and echo. Gratitude follows grace like, like thunder follows lightning. If the essence of God is grace, oh, this is so good. If the essence of God is grace, then the essence of human beings as God's people is our gratitude. That's the essence of that. Uh, the grace and gratitude are twin experiences. Gratitude, this trait of being graced, thankfulness, the action that follows out of that gratitude. Yeah, I love words. You all know this about me, right? In the Old Testament, there are a bunch of words for this idea of gratitude and thankfulness coming out of grace. The, Hebrew, the first one in Hebrew is toda. Say that with me. Toda. Now you know Hebrew. Good job. Todah is an action of praise. It's a confession of goodness. How many times do you think, oh, we're going to confess, oh, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm sinful, I stink. I'm... No, you can have confessions of goodness, confessions of praise, confessions of thanks. And Todah is tied to this Hebrew verb that's barak. It means to bless. And, you know, every single day, the, people, the Hebrew people, they pray uh, up from the time of Jesus, even before, up until now, they pray in the same way. Every one of their prayers begins this, week, this way. Baruch atah Adonai Elohenu Melech HaOlam. Ah, that's beautiful. That's really nice. That's really good. In English, what does that mean? Blessed are you, O Lord God, King of the universe. Every prayer, when they wake up, Baruch atah Adonai Melech HaOlam. For breakfast, baruch atah Adonai ha'alim. For lunch, for going outside, baruch atah. For, for going to bed, baruch atah Adonai. Blessing are you, O Lord God, King of the universe. 
Commentators Walter Ewell and Barry Beitzel say that gratitude in the Old Testament is never coerced or fabricated in one's mind. Rather, it is a joyful commitment of one's personality to God. Did you catch that? A joyful commitment of one's personality to God. Your Myers-Briggs, your Enneagram, the big six, whatever psychological test you want to take, it comes back to the point that a joyful commitment of our personality to God is gratitude, and that comes out. That's a personality thing. And they continue, gratitude to God as a way of life is the only way a life is enjoyed. Man, there are way too many people in the church who are like the two crusty Muppets up in the corner. Well, but Pastor Jim, you don't understand. I am just well, wired this way. I am just naturally grump. No, you're not. <laughs> not if you're a follower of Jesus. No, you're not. Because we've been grace gift and gratitude comes out of that. Gratitude is, oh, gratitude is a life of praise. It is a steering of our attention and our intention to offer sacrifices of thanks to God for who he is, for what he has done. You know, a sacrifice is costly, right? It's not the spare change I found in the seat cushions of my couch. And then, you know, another word, another Hebrew word, for gratitude in our Bibles, how it's translated. You want to get this? This is great. Gratitude, it's translated like this. Gratitude is translated as bow down in worship. Bow down in thanks. Gratitude is a heart of worshipful thanks. It is a life lived in reverence and awe. That's an awesome life. The Latin word I mentioned earlier for gratitude is gratia, but the first Christians, they wrote to one another in the commercial language of the day, which is Greek. The Greek word for gratitude is the beautiful word charis or grace. And for the early church, charis was this understanding that everything in life is a gift that we have been giving. And if everything is a gift, the only response is one of gratefulness and an offering of thankfulness in response. If everything is a gift, then what else do we have to do but to say, wow. The Lexham Bible Dictionary says this, most Greek words related to thanks are semantically connected. They have wirings that are very similar, including the noun thanksgiving, the adjective thankful, and the verb to give thanks or be thankful. Oh, I love this. You ready for this? You ready for what the Greek word for all of this is? It's eucharisteo. Why does that matter? Why is that important? Because in the church, what we do today isn't communion. For 2,000 years, this is the Eucharist meal. This is the table of thanksgiving. This is the table, the meal of grace. The, the, in a few moments, we get to come to this table and, and, and we get to experience what? The grace of the Lord. We get to come to this table of thanksgiving, the Eucharist meal. Why? Because he's already done the work. Friends, brothers and sisters, you and I, as followers of Jesus, we're hardwired to respond to life with gratitude, to have actions of sacrificial thankfulness, of worship, and giving praise back to the Lord. John Wesley, the founder of the movement of Methodism, he insisted that gratitude lived out in thankfulness was a gift that freed us of all anxiety. Anybody have anxiety? I was on medication for it in my last church. Anxiety was so much. Do you know what I learned in the midst of all that? My gratitude stunk. 
My gratitude stunk. Wesley wrote this. He says, because God is good, we can cast all our anxieties on him, 1 Peter 5, 7. And get this, this is so good. We don't have to carry the weight of anxiety itself or the burden of trying to figure out why something is happening to us. God cares. God knows. God gives grace. We live in the strength that these affirmations give. Thanksgiving is the evidence that we are staying in love with God. Whoo. Thanksgiving is the evidence that we are staying in love with God. Come to the table, experience his grace, be thankful. With the early church, these are means of grace, ways in which we position ourselves to know the love of God, to stay in love with God. You want to know, here you go, really practical, you ready? You want to know how to deal with the current polit- polit- political anxiety? You want to know? Yeah. This is free, you ready for it? Here you go, here's how to do it. Be thankful. Amen. Oh, but Pastor Jim, again, What's going to happen? Be thankful. You want to live in that Red Bull energy of Psalm, like, Psalm 100? You want to live that way? Marinate in gratitude. Churn in gratitude. Too many of us are churning in negative social media news. Crap, excuse me. We're just sitting in it. It's like, it's like a toddler sitting in a spoiled diaper. That's no good for anybody. We do it all the time. Instead, marinate in gratitude. Want to be a kingdom of Jesus person all the time? Here you go. See the grace of God and be thankful. He's done it all, right? Want to rise above the grab of a world that says consume, consume, consume? Then sacrificially give back. Now, I've been here for 11 months. You know, I have yet to speak about tithes and offerings at the church. Don't worry, that's coming too. I want to do it when we're all here though. I <laughs> want to miss anybody to miss out on that one. But we give our tithes and offerings. We put money in those boxes, not to keep the lights on or, or, or not to pay the salaries, though I'm very appreciative of that. No, we don't do that for that reason. We give each and every week sacrificially as a response to the grace that we have received. That's why we put money in those boxes. It's a spiritual discipline. It is a positioning ourselves to respond to the grace that God has given us in our lives. We give to things like the Next Step campaign. Yes, we're still talking about that. We do that because we see God at work and we're thankful and we want to continue it. Not to pay down debt. To free us to do more. Because God's done a great work. Gratitude, brothers and sisters, is a family trait. It is a way of being that continues to advance the kingdom of Jesus. Being grateful and living in gratitude isn't just a November thing. It's an everyday identity of Jesus living in this world through you and me thing. The Eucharist is a table of gratitude. It's a table of thanksgiving because he's done it all. He's invited you and me to a new way of life, of living living through the offering of his blood and his body broken and shed for us. He is the bread of life. This is the cup of the living. Anybody dead in the room? No real hands going up. That's good. We're the people of life. So how will we then receive it? How will we then live it? Psalm 100, shout with joy to the Lord, all the earth. 
Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good. And his unfailing love continues forever. And his faithfulness continues to each generation. Glory be to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.